need 41 out of those 50 to stop an appropriation. You do it by filibustering. And if you control the House of Representatives, Speaker Pelosi, it's even easier. You don't even need that. The Speaker can keep the appropriation bill from getting to the floor of the House for a vote. The majority gets to control that. The war in Iraq would have been over, uh, should have been over, uh, whatever it is, 14 months ago. And it hasn't happened. And so the question is, why should anyone believe that this is a party that's gonna, gonna take us down a course to change anything that's happening as regards this war? But it gets even worse. Those numbers I mentioned earlier, that had gone from 116 billion before Pelosi became president to now the request for 178, that's not military spending, that's just the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Military spending in the United States is, is basically around $450 billion a year, not including those numbers. And if you go back to 2000, military spending was closer to $300 billion. So in this very short amount of time, we've got astronomical spending, close to 60% of all of our tax dollars are going to the military to pay for the war, to pay for debt on the war. And Senator Obama and Clinton want to increase military spending. And Senator Obama wants 100,000 more combat troops. And when he talks about removing combat troops from Iraq, he's talking about redeploying them in Afghanistan. This is not a winning strategy, and this is not what people have in mind when they oppose the war and they want a party to do something about it. To read you his line again, we can't afford a president whose positions change with the politics of the moment. Now, it's not just on issues related to the war that the Democrats are not offering uh, anything that we should believe in. On a host of other issues, before I got into the contest with, with Ralph Nader, I realized as I looked at these issues that this promise that's being offered to us, this idea that we're going to change the culture of Washington, is simply not true. We're dealing with Senator Obama, who's the front runner and likely to be the Democratic nominee. But he has had so many opportunities. He is the problem in the United States Senate. He is voting with Republicans on measures that are harmful to the American people. He has not demonstrated a willingness to change the culture of Washington as a senator. So the question is, what can he tell us that makes us think it's going to be any different? Obviously, his position on the war isn't encouraging. His position on the Patriot Act isn't encouraging. Let me give you a few examples. He supported a Republican class action reform uh, bill that made it harder to bring class action lawsuits in the state courts. He, he helped push them into the federal courts, and at the time, this was called a big business extravaganza. The nation published numerous articles about how everybody knew, although this was being touted as a way to streamline lawsuits, that this was a purely to benefit American corporations, and here's why. You take those wage and hour claims, the Walmart cases, where you've got workers who are trying to get breaks and get better wages, well, when those lawsuits, when we tried to make those lawsuits happen in the federal courts, you know what? Federal courts wouldn't certify these lawsuits. The state courts, four of them got certified, and the law now favors these employees on a number of these issues. Wouldn't have happened under this Class Action Reform Act. Why would a civil rights lawyer who says he's for the people and the working poor, why would he do that? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. By the way, John Kerry and uh, Hillary Clinton voted against it. He has supported in his tenure in the Illinois legislature and in the United States Senate limiting pain and suffering damages in medical malpractice cases, what we call uh, uh, tort cases. And let me try to explain the significance of this. Um, there are what are called economic and then non-economic damages. Economic damages are going to be things like what did the surgery cost to try to fix whatever problem you have, and then what is your lost wages into the future. And then the non-economic damages are things like pain and suffering. Uh, how, how, how bad was, was this injury to you? And let a jury try to estimate what would be an appropriate means of compensation. Now, 
It may sound good when you're thinking, oh yeah, our country's got too many lawsuits, we really got to fix this up, but let me give you an example of how this works. Let's say the two of us have the identical injury. Let's say they accidentally cut the wrong leg, leg off or some horrible thing like that. And um, we both bring lawsuits. And in this gentleman's lawsuit, uh, pain and suffering is limited, just like it is in my case. So we put that number there, that's the most you can get, whatever it might be, $100,000, $200,000 for the rest of your life. And then we try to calculate the economic damages. Well, to correct the surgery, whatever they could do, to limit the harm, it's gonna be the same. But then they go into what, what do we get paid for a living? What's our job? How does it impact our job? And if he's wealthier than I am, his damages are higher. So two people with the same injury favors somebody with wealth who has a greater economic harm to be able to present to a jury. Supporting this kind of thing is contrary to caring about working poor, who would make up damages through pain and suffering, not through economic damages. And this sort of legal speak is the thing that they're counting on you not to be able to, to get. Obama also opposed an important reform, uh, astoundingly, frankly, for somebody that wants to change the culture of Washington. A law that was signed into effect by Ulysses Grant was primarily a law for prospectors who would go mine hard rock minerals on public lands. Back in the 1870s, you would be charged, if you were a prospector, $2.50 an acre, maybe $5 an acre, and anything you found under that ground, you could take home with you. Didn't have to pay the government any royalties whatsoever. Well, finally, we've tried to reform this as multinational corporations, uh, you know, last year made a billion dollars mining on our property and not paying royalties. And this is an industry, by the way, that spends it's estimated in a five or six year period from 1998 to 2003, $60 million lobbying in Congress to keep the law from being changed. Well, Obama would not support a law that got passed in the House of Representatives miraculously that would have required 4% royalties on existing mines and 8% royalties on new mines. By comparison, if you're an oil company, and you get a permission to drill in the Gulf of Mexico or something like that, the Bureau of Land Management or whatever is going to charge you somewhere between 12 and 16 percent royalties, okay? So four to eight percent is nothing, and they're not paying anything up to this time except this flat $2.50, $5 uh, an acre thing, and Barack Obama wants you to believe that you vote for him, he's going to change the culture of Washington, and he came out against that. Now, it's, um, it's incredibly unfortunate to see this happen because the law is so poorly written right now that these mining companies, multinational mining companies, will pay $5 an acre, dig holes in the ground, and then leave the holes for taxpayers to have to uh, clean up after. So we end up essentially subsidizing their mining operations.